See the child. He is pale and thin. He wears a thin and ragged linen shirt. He stokes the scullery fire. Outside lie dark turned fields with rags of snow, and darker woods beyond that harbor yet a few last wolves. His folk are known for hewers of wood, and drawers of water, but in truth his father has been a schoolmaster. He lies in drink. He quotes from poets whose names are now lost. The boy crouches by the fire and watches him. Nine of your birth, thirty-three. The Leonids, they were called. God, how the stars did fall. I looked for blackness, holes in the heavens, the dipper stove. The mother dead these fourteen years did incubate in her own bosom the creature who would carry her off. The father never speaks her name. The child does not know it. He has a sister in this world that he will not see again. He watches, pale and unwashed. He can neither read nor write, and in him broods already a taste for mindless violence. All history present in that visage. The child, the father of the man. On the morning of September 13th, 1847, just outside Mexico City, the condemned men of the St. Patrick's Battalion stood along a row of gallows, nooses around their necks, and watched in the distance as American Marines stormed the castle of Chapultepec, the fabled Halls of Montezuma. These Irish-American soldiers had defected from the United States during the Mexican-American War in response to anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic sentiment among their countrymen. Earlier at the Battle of Churubusco, they had fought under the command of Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, of Alamo fame, putting up fierce resistance against the invasion force, until they were eventually taken prisoner. Labeled as traitors, the 50 captured San Patricios were flogged, branded, and eventually hanged in the largest mass execution in American history. As one final humiliation, their execution was forestalled until they could see the U.S. flag raised above the castle at which point they would be launched into eternity. Present at this moment was a young Samuel Chamberlain, who painted the event from memory years later. A New Englander by birth, Chamberlain took seriously Horace Greeley's exhortation, Go West, young man, and at 17, he joined the 2nd Illinois Volunteer Regiment in Mexico. After the war, Chamberlain joined an infamous gang of scalp hunters, led by the notorious John Joel Glanton which was contracted by the Mexican state of Chihuahua to hunt down the Apache tribes in the region. What followed was a bacchanal of bloodshed that tore swaths through the American Southwest until finally it was brought to an end in the infamous Yuma Ferry Massacre. Chamberlain, who was one of the few survivors of the expedition, returned to New England and later served as a Union general in the Civil War, suffering wounds on six separate occasions. After the war, he took up painting and many of his works survive today, several based on memories from his time in the West during the Mexican War. Chamberlain left behind a written memoir as well, My Confession, The Recollections of a Rogue, in which he detailed his experience with the Glanton Gang. This book serves as the historical basis of Cormac McCarthy's 1985 masterpiece, Blood Meridian. Born Charles Joseph McCarthy Jr. in 1933 to Irish Catholic parents, Cormac McCarthy grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, where his father worked as a lawyer for the TVA. His childhood in the Smokies would inspire his first novel, published in 1965, The Orchard Keeper, about a young boy, his grandfather, the titular arborist, and the bootlegger who killed the boy's father. The period during which he wrote his Tennessee novels were lean years for McCarthy, and he lived for a time on a pig farm before moving into a barn he had converted into a shack. In his second novel, Outer Dark, a baby is born to the siblings Rinthy and Culla. After exposing the child in the woods, Rinthy discovers that the child's body is missing, and she sets off in pursuit of a tinker whom she suspects has taken the infant. McCarthy's third novel, Child of God, set in Sevier County, tells the story of Lester Ballard, a social outcast and necrophiliac who begins a murder spree and takes his victims to live with him in nearby caves. 
1976, McCarthy, much like the kid in Blood Meridian, left Tennessee for Texas, where he settled in El Paso. In 1979, the semi-autobiographical novel Sutri was published in which the title character leaves a life of privilege in New England to work in a poor riverbank community of Knoxville. It has been likened by some readers to a modern Huckleberry Finn. It is likely that after the move to Texas, a copy of Chamberlain's Confession, discovered and first published in Life magazine in 1956, came into McCarthy's possession and spurred him to begin writing his historical novel, Blood Meridian. The novel follows an unnamed protagonist, referred to only as The Kid, and he falls in with the same gang of scalp hunters Chamberlain had in the Southwest. It is easy to forget that Blood Meridian is a historical novel, as many of the historical characters take on a life of their own. Foregrounding the novel are the consequences of the Mexican-American War, the legacy of which most Americans unknowingly live with today. Mexican independence came in 1821, following a bloody war of independence with Spain. In an attempt to shore up the more sparsely populated states of the North, Mexican authorities encouraged settlement by Anglo-Americans, who were all too happy to oblige. Swearing loyalty to Mexico, while ignoring the Mexican prescription of slavery, they poured into Texas, beginning in the 1820s, and established themselves on massive cattle ranches. An old cowboy joke about Texas was that the way to find it was to go east until you smell it, then go south till you step in it. War broke out in 1836, and after the defeat of Santa Ana by Sam Houston, protege of Andrew Jackson, at the Battle of San Jacinto, Texas became a de facto independent republic. The question over Texan statehood would be postponed due to the issue of slavery until 1845, when another of Jackson's disciples, James Polk, became president after campaigning on a platform of manifest destiny. Polk sent troops under the command of Zachary Taylor into the disputed border area between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande, and when they were fired upon by the Mexican army, he declared that American blood had been shed on American soil, and the national honor demanded a declaration of war. After an amphibious landing at Veracruz, General Winfield Scott, old fuss and feathers, directed the American Expeditionary Force to Mexico City, following the same route taken 328 years earlier by Cortez and the original conquistadors. After defeating Santa Ana in a number of battles along the way, one in which the Generalissimo's artificial leg was captured by the Illinois Volunteer Infantry at Cerro Gordo, Scott captured Mexico City in 1847, and the war concluded the following year. The subsequent Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo cost Mexico half its territory and increase that of the United States by a third. Despite being a decisive American victory, the Mexican War was one of the most controversial conflicts ever fought by the United States. Supporters of the war argued that America had a God-given right to new lands in the West for settlement and the expansion of slavery, while opponents argued that it was an unjust war provoked by the United States in order to rob territory of a sister republic on the continent. Whig statesmen, like Henry Clay, whose son was killed at the Battle of Buena Vista, were outspoken against the conduct of the war in Mexico and wanted more improvements at home before any adventures abroad. Another critic of Mr. Polk's war was a young Illinois congressman named Abraham Lincoln, who demanded on the floor of the House of Representatives that the president point out on a map the spot where the war had begun. Critics began to refer to him as Spotty Lincoln for his persistence, and he openly referred to the war as a war of conquest fought to catch votes. Another American critic of the war was one of its veterans, Ulysses S. Grant. For myself, Grant wrote in his memoirs, I was bitterly opposed to the measure, and to this day regard the war, which resulted, as one of the most unjust ever waged by a stronger nation against a weaker nation. The transcendentalist Henry David Thoreau, the author of Walden, was jailed for refusing to pay taxes that would have supported the war effort, planting the seed for his essay, Civil Disobedience. There was also the unresolved question of social forces unleashed by the war. 
Blood Meridian depicts the chaotic world of the American Southwest in the aftermath of the Peace of Guadalupe Hidalgo, a peace that was resented by many Americans for failing to take even more Mexican land. Near the beginning of the novel, the kid joins a filibustering expedition to Sonora, led by Captain White in 1849. White, a firm believer in Manifest Destiny, echoes the justifications of countless imperialists when he declares the expedition into Mexico to be a civilizing mission. There is no government in Mexico. Hell, there's no God in Mexico. Never will be. We are dealing with a people manifestly incapable of governing themselves. And do you know what happens with people who cannot govern themselves? That's right. Others come in to govern for them. Filibusters were unauthorized military adventurers who attempted to foment insurrections in the newly independent nations of Latin America. The expedition of Captain White is based loosely on the exploits of the most famous American filibuster, William Walker, who invaded Sonora in 1853 and briefly declared himself its president. He was driven out and later attempted to usurp the presidency of Nicaragua. He was driven out again in 1857 and would eventually be captured and shot by the government of Honduras in 1860. American imperial designs on Nicaragua did not end with Walker, as the first readers of Blood Meridian would have known in 1985, as it became public knowledge that the Reagan administration had been illegally selling guns to Iran in order to provide clandestine support for the Contra rebels in their fight against the Sandinistas. Like Walker, Blood Meridian's Captain White would meet an ignominious end, after a Comanche attack wipes out most of his forces, and he is eventually beheaded by the locals, who place his head in a jar of vinegar and feed his body to hogs. The most powerful tribes in the southwest at the time of the novel are the Apache, led by their chieftain Mangus Coloradus, or Red Sleeve. Mangus became a chief in 1837, stepping into a power vacuum created by the murder of a previous chief and his war band after they were ambushed by scalp hunters. He remained chief until his death in 1863, and the depopulated Santa Rita del Cobre mines encountered by the Glanton gang are a testament to the strength of the Apache. Later, the gang will encounter Mangus himself and slip away after paying for an insult by procuring a barrel of whiskey for him. The efforts of Mangus, spurred on by the atrocities of earlier white paramilitaries, are what lead Governor Trias of Chihuahua to seek out the services of the Glanton gang in the first place. Their presence only contributes to an existing cycle of violence that consumes men, women, and children indiscriminately. All else was heaped on the flames, and while the sun rose and glistened on their gaudy faces, they sat upon the ground, each with his new goods before him, watched the fire and smoked their pipes, as might some painted troop of mine folk, crooting themselves in such a way place, far from the towns and the rabble hooting at them across the smoking foot lamps, contemplating towns to come and the poor fanfare of trumpet and drum, and the rude boards upon which their destinies were inscribed, for these people were no less bound and indentured, and they watched the prefiguration of their own ends, the carbonized skulls of their enemies incandescing before them, bright as blood among the coals. It is a vision of cruel egalitarianism in which all are equally capable of being killers. Of all the real-world killers in Blood Meridian, few are as infamous as John Joel Glanton. The historical Glanton, bound for California in the gold rush of 49, stopped off in Chihuahua to offer his services to the government in order to finance the rest of his trip. The state would offer up bounties of up to $200 for each slain native. The receipts that had to be collected in order to ensure payment for services rendered were scalps. The profit motive soon redoubled on the contractors as soldiers of fortune began massacring Mexicans as well as Amerindians for similar looking scalps and therefore bigger payouts. They entered the city haggard and filthy and reeking with the blood of the citizenry for whose protection they had contracted. The scalps of the slain villagers were strung from the windows of the governor's house, and the parsons were paid out of the all but exhausted coffers, and the sociedad was disbanded, and the bounty rescinded. 
within a week of their quitting the city, there would be a price of 8,000 pesos posted for Glanton's head. There was also more than mere financial incentive to the mutilation of Mexican and Amerindian bodies. According to an 1883 account by Richard Irving Dodge, Of the two ways in which the Indian soul can be prevented from reaching its paradise, the first is by scalping the head of the dead body. Scalping is annihilation. The soul ceases to exist. This accounts for the care they take to avoid being themselves scalped. Let the scalp be torn off, and the body becomes mere carrion, not even worthy of burial. The other method by which an Indian can be cut off from the happy hunting grounds is by strangulation. Should death ensue by strangulation, the soul can never escape, but must always remain with or hovering near the remains, even after complete decomposition. Glanton fought Mexicans during the Mexican War as a Texas Ranger, and later killed Indians and Mexicans for profit. Chamberlain writes in his memoirs that Glanton's 17-year-old fiancé had been taken and killed by Indians in Texas. From this tragic scene, Glanton returned a changed man. He drank deeply and sought the companionship of the most hardened desperados of the frontier. In all Indian fights, he was the devil incarnate. Another diabolical figure that emerges from my confession into Blood Meridian is the enigmatic Judge Holden of Texas. Unique among the historical characters of the novel, as his existence has never been corroborated outside of Chamberlain's account. The second in command, now left in charge of the camp, was a man of gigantic size called Judge Holden of Texas. Who or what he was, no one knew, but a cooler-blooded villain never went unhung. He stood six feet six in his moccasins and had a large, fleshy frame, a dull, tallow-colored face, destitute of hair and all expression. Holden was by far the best educated man in northern Mexico. He conversed with all in their own language, spoke in several Indian lingos, and at a fandango would take the harp or guitar from the hands of the musicians and charm all with his wonderful performance and outwaltz any poblana of the ball. He was plumb center with rifle or revolver, a daring horseman acquainted with the nature of all the strange plants and their botanical names, great in geology and mineralogy, in short, another Admiral Crichton, and withal an errant coward. Not but that he possessed enough courage to fight Indians and Mexicans, or anyone, where he had the advantage in strength, skills, and weapons, but where the combat would be equal, he would avoid it if possible. I hated him at first sight, and he knew it. Yet nothing could be more gentle and kind than his deportment towards me. He would often seek conversation with me, and speak of Massachusetts, and to my astonishment, I found he knew more about Boston than I did. His desires was blood and women, and terrible stories were circulated in camp of horrid crimes committed by him when bearing another name in the Cherokee Nation and Texas. And before we left Fronteras, a little girl of ten years was found in the chaparral, foully violated and murdered. The mark of a huge hand on her little throat pointed him out as the ravisher, as no other man had such a hand, but though all suspected, no one charged him with the crime. McCarthy takes Chamberlain's description of the judge as hairless, meaning without beard or mustache, and tallow or pale, to the extreme, and depicts his version of Holden as an albino of prodigious girth, entirely without hair on his body. McCarthy's judge is preternatural, and like Chamberlain's, unknown are his beginning and his end. While the world of Blood Meridian is violent and male-dominated, one historical woman of note makes an important appearance. Sarah Borginis, popularly known as the Great Western, a nickname derived from her size, comparing her to the largest steamboat built to that day, the Great Western. During the Mexican War, she became a cook and laundress for the army of Zachary Taylor. One legend recalls that at Buena Vista, she received a saber wound to the cheek while manning a cannon, and that after the war, General Scott ordered that she receive a pension for her service. She appears in Chamberlain's confession as a Wild West wife of Bath, courting the soldiers of the army as they advance into Mexico. She rode up to Colonel Washington and asked permission to accompany the expedition. The colonel referred her to Major Rucker, who informed her that if she would marry one of the dragoons and be mustered in as a laundress, she could go. 
her ladyship gave a military salute and replied, All right, Major, I'll marry the whole squadron and you thrown in, but I go along. Riding along the front of the line, she cried out, Who wants a wife with $15,000 and the biggest leg in Mexico? Come, my beauties, don't all speak at once. Who is the lucky man? Whether the thought that the great Western had one husband in the 7th Infantry and another in Harney's Dragoons made the men hesitate, I know not. But at first, no one seemed disposed to accept the offer. Finally, Davis of Company E said, I have no objections to making you my wife, if there's a clergyman to tie the knot. With a laugh, the heroine replied, Bring your blanket to my tent tonight, and I will learn you to tie a knot that will satisfy you, I reckon. Chamberlain further records that it was a short honeymoon. With the party from New Mexico was a man of remarkable size and strength. Madame Sarah Borginus Davis, the Great Western, saw this Hercules while he was bathing and conceived a violent passion for his gigantic proportions. She sought an interview and with blushes told her love. The Samson, nothing loath, became the willing captive to this modern Delilah, who straightaway kicked Davis out of her affections and tent, and established her elephantine lover in full possession without further ceremony. Sarah appears in Blood Meridian at the Yuma Ferry Crossing, where she shames Cloyce Bell for his treatment of his brother, referred to only as the idiot up to this point, by keeping him in a cage. Sarah washes the idiot, whose name is revealed to be James Robert Bell, and provides him with clean clothes, in keeping with her previous role in the army as a laundress. The Great Western provides a rare moment of feminine mercy in a world of masculine violence and cruelty. The controversy that surrounded American imperialism in Mexico would have had eerie parallels to more contemporary events in McCarthy's own lifetime. The fall of Saigon occurred ten years before the publication of Blood Meridian, and like the Mexican War of the 1840s, war in Vietnam was divisive, the anti-war activist employing Thoreau's civil disobedience in protest across the nation. Vietnam was not without its share of atrocities. On March 16, 1968, between 300 and 500 Vietnamese men, women, and children were murdered by GIs in what came to be known as the My Lai Massacre. Several women were victims of gang rape, and others were mutilated. 26 soldiers were tried, but only one was convicted, Lieutenant William Calley Jr., who served only three and a half months of what was originally a life sentence under house arrest. In addition to My Lai, the exploits of a 45-man patrol unit of the 101st Airborne, known as Tiger Force, also achieved notoriety during the war. The unit patrolled the highlands of South Vietnam, torturing, killing, and mutilating civilians as they came across. Strikingly, they took scalps from the slain and hung them from their M16s. One member of the unit even wore a necklace of ears. Others kicked the teeth out of villagers in order to claim gold fillings. Tiger Force was merely a modern reincarnation of the Glanton Gang. And they saw one day a pack of vicious looking humans mounted on unshod Indian ponies riding half drunk through the streets, bearded, barbarous, clad in the skins of animals stitched up with thews, and armed with weapons of every description, revolvers of enormous weight, bowie knives the size of claymores, and short, two-barreled rifles with bores you could stick your thumbs in, and the trappings of their horses fashioned out of human skin and their bridles woven up from human hair, and decorated with human teeth, and the riders wearing scapulars or necklaces of dried and blackened human ears, and the horses raw-looking and wild in the eye, and their teeth bared like feral dogs, and riding also in the company a number of half-naked savages, reeling in the saddle, Dangerous, filthy, brutal, the whole like a visitation from some heathen land where they and others like them fed on human flesh. Hundreds are estimated to have been murdered by Tiger Force. Women and girls were frequently victims of sexual assault. The unit's commander, Gerald Morse, self-styled as Ghost Rider, gave the unit its own body count quotas in imitation of General Westmoreland. Ultimately, no member of the unit including its commander, 
was ever prosecuted. Near the conclusion of the novel, the kid, now the man, encounters the judge in a saloon in Fort Griffin, Texas, decades after they rode together with Glenn. The judge, tellingly, has not aged. The world goes on. We have dancing nightly, and this night is no exception. The straight and the winding way are one. And now that you are here, what do the years count since last we two met together? Men's memories are uncertain, and the past that was differs little from the past that was not. The judge's discourse suggests that despite being a historical novel, Blood Meridian claims an authority higher than the sources it is based upon. Blood Meridian is not a novel of the Mexican War, nor of the Vietnam War, but of all wars, everywhere, and at all times. McCarthy's aim to transcend history applies not merely to historical sources, but to literary sources as well. It is this relationship of Blood Meridian to the works that provided its inspiration that we will explore in Episode 2.